Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jay, for the marvelous introduction. And welcome to the arena, shall we say, of where philosophy and neuroscience meet, and hopefully cooperate in developing new insights, new ways of looking at brain functions. I want to also thank this, the uh, artist, Elizabeth Jameson, for this marvelous poster, which uh, you know, I'm sure you've all uh, seen on the wall. She herself has a neurological disability, which has kindled her interest. And it gives me a launch pad for describing uh, the activities of brains of a particular kind. And I'm focusing now on the difference between machines and humans, uh, that machines are highly competent at doing many tasks, but basically they don't know what they're doing. In fact, that is a big problem for the design of artificial intelligence, physical intelligence, of how to characterize knowledge as distinct from information. And this is essentially a philosophical problem which needs to be addressed before you can fully rationally approach the question of how do the brains make knowledge. We have to know what it is that we're trying to do. So I want to offer the outset some philosophical definitions. There are many that you can find in the literature, but these suffice for me to establish a relationship between my observations on the anatomy and physiology of brains and this conceptual question of, first, what is information? And second, how does it differ from knowledge? Information that I write here is a collection of facts, elements, features, sensed about something or someone, and can be expressed in numbers. Whereas knowledge is an understanding of the interrelationships among the fragments of information, and that understanding has been gathered by an experience, actually functioning of the brain, directing the body into the outside world. And I define intelligence as the ability to use knowledge to solve problems. I want to focus on three aspects of brain function and dynamics. And I'm going to cover these fairly rapidly in order to get to my end point so that I will not attempt to prove my descriptions or statements of what I think is, is happening, but will do my best to describe this for the diversity of experiences that you all have in the accumulation of your knowledge, because no two accumulations overlap no two of us have the same knowledge base, and yet each of us has our own that we must deal with. So I'm going to begin by describing brain function primarily in terms of olfactory dynamics, and thereby to ground my description of Merleau-Ponty's action perception cycle, how it is that the brain actively directs the body into the environment to collect information, bring it back to the senses, and then assimilate and accommodate and to incorporate that into the body of knowledge. Having introduced this fundamental array of processes in brains, I want now to discuss what it is that's actually happening at the level of the neurons, which are the processes which are binding together uh, the information into a base of knowledge, which I describe now as a field. And I'm following here as I will show you the example of Wolfgang Kerr and his development of Gestalt theory. And then finally, 
time permitting, I want to talk about the way in which these frames of knowledge are initiated, how they're created, what is it that happens, and what carries them forward into uh, the full participation of the brain in each action perception cycle. And this will be essentially a description of phase transitions. And I want to introduce you to the notion that is, and I suppose here it is highly speculative and theoretical, but I want to propose that the cortex, which is this outer shell of roughly 2,000 square centimeters in each of us, has not only the capacity for generating action potentials and dendritic potentials, but also for a unique state which I characterize as liquid life as opposed to gas life. In the terms of the single neurons operating in great numbers, each of them can be regarded as a particle in a gas-like phase. And at some point, there is a critical chain in which they coalesce, condense, into a different state. And I call that a phase transition in analogy to the conversion of a vapor into a liquid. So with that introduction to my outline, I'll proceed now to introduce you to the work of Charles Judson and Herrick half a century ago, completing, in fact, a half century of work on the comparative anatomy of brains. And he adopted the tiger salamander as the best surviving example of what the ancestor of all vertebrates must have looked like. And this now is the brain of a salamander. It's roughly the size of a lima bean that is about four by six millimeters and shows the two hemispheres, the three world hemispheres, which are the forebrain. There is a subdivision of this forebrain into three parts. One is olfactory, that's the anterior third, and there's a motor substrate, the lateral piriform cortex, and a medial structure, the hippocampus. These are the three main elements supporting the action perception cycle. Essentially, the beginning would be the emergence from the interaction of all of these three of these parts of the cerebrum in the formation of an action pattern, which essentially is a prediction of what it is that an animal is expecting to find and what it's going to do in order to initiate the search for information. And that global pattern formed by the, is formed by the unified oscillations of the neurons and the gamma range over the entire cerebral cortex. And that's not too hard to imagine, considering that each of these hemispheres is only four, two by four millimeters in dimension, so that it's relatively easy to conceive of neurons which will span the entire distance. Not most, but a few, and as few is sufficient. Now, the action of the action perception cycle is to initiate a movement <coughs> in the environment to collect the information from that and then determine where this animal was at the time it took the sample, when it did so, and then to predict, predict what the next step going to be. And that is a sequential process which enables it to orient itself and maintain a continuing flow of information. And each sample now is incorporated into the whole. The remarkable thing is that this mode of function was the ground state from which all the other senses emerged. You'll notice here in the center there is a TA, that transitional area, and that's what Harry designated as the location where the input from all the other senses come. That is, from vision, from touch, and from hearing, 
the distance receptors, all of which allow an animal time between the acquisitions of the information and the arrival of the teeth or the fire or the food, whatever is of interest to the animal. This transitional area now <coughs> is expanded, as you can see here, in the brain of a whale, in the brain of a rat. The, these differ in mass by 10,000 fold, but they have essentially the same dynamics. And this now is a central clue to say that the dynamics is what we call scale-free. Doesn't matter how big the brain is, it basically works the same way. And that is an enormous simplification. Another simplification is that all of the sensory systems at this level of convergence into a single functioning entity, they all have the same code, the same pattern of operation. This now is again a major simplification because it means that we have the basis for the formation of what Curler called the Gestalt. Now, this is a representation of the action perception cycle, which I use to define the quantities that I'm talking about here. There is basically the interaction of each of us as entities in an environment, and I schematize that as the interaction between a predator and its prey, the fox and the rabbit. Each of them now is giving off signs and doing so by breathing out and carrying the molecules of structure of itself into the environment as scent. And these molecules now are carried by diffusion and will land onto the receptors of animals in the vicinity so that the odor of a fox now falls onto the receptors of the rabbit and that, in the terminology adopted by James Barham, carries the system to a basin of attraction, which is essentially an expression of the memory that the animal has, that the rabbit has about fox. And that constitutes its knowledge base. And similarly, the rabbit by exhalation gives off molecules of scent and they're picked up by the fox. Now, the meaning of these differs. For the rabbit, the scent of fox means run home because danger is in the vicinity. The molecules for the fox mean lunch. So we have the interaction on a large energy, high energy scale between these two as the rabbit runs the bird's den and the fox runs in pursuit. One or the other is going to win this context. But what's important for us is the distinction between the meaning of the information and the knowledge of that information. That is to say, the information essentially is, is in the scent low energy and it evokes or elicits the knowledge the animal has to implement the meaning which is either to run well in both cases to run uh, for differing reasons now what i want to focus on is the delivery of the information from the sign to the attractor which in the case of olfaction would be the odor given to the olfactory receptors in the nose, carried by action potentials into the olfactory bulb. Single axon step to initiate the process. And what happens now is shown here in the field potentials of the olfactory bulb. What you see is the recording of the top three traces Actually, there's just one trace there. It's the bipolar recording across the olfactory bulb dipole. And the lower one is, uh, well, it's the same thing at a different time a little later. 
What you see is the background activity. There's always background activity. And the question is, well, where does it come from? And we have now a very simple answer. It comes from mutual excitation. That is to say, here you have an immense number of excitatory neurons and an even larger number of inhibitory neurons. The excitatory neurons are exciting each other and in the process now are maintaining a steady level. Now, why doesn't this activity simply blow up into a seizure? It's because each neuron has a refractory period. Once it's fired, it can't fire again until it's had an opportunity to rest, recover, and reestablish its ability. So that, that refractory period puts a lid on it, and you have the maintenance of a steady state. If the activity is driven above that level, it'll decay back to it. If it's allowed to fall below, or if it's inhibited, it'll come back up. So it's governed by a steady state attractor, what we call a non-zero attractor, because if it's simply shut off, you know, that's just a dead state. But this is an active state. And it's that activity which is reorganized by the input. This is seen now here, those double arrows that you see is where I have a cat in a box doing nothing. Cat settles down, it's hungry, but there's nothing to do. And so it saves its energy, quietly rests. <coughs> now I put in just a whiff of fish, and this really turns the animal on. You can see that he revs up his olfactory bulb with these discharges you see up on the top. And he meows, he's crawling around inside. Where's the fish? After I fed him to satiety, he settles down again. And you can see the odor has no effect. He ignores it, it's no longer important. What this shows is that the response that the animal is making, this reorganization of the background activity, derives its energy from the animal itself. It's not like the ringing of a bell, it is a creation of a pattern of activity, the release of immense quantities of energy. There is a further point that this display of activity is intermittent. It's pulsatile, it's packaged. Those of you who work with the internet understand that you have packaged distribution, that you wait until there's an accumulation of messages and then send it. That's batch processing. That's what the olfactory system is doing, and we have evidence now that that's what every other sensory system is doing. Making what we call a wave packet, which now, in the case of olfaction, is easily shown to be triggered by inhalation. You have a breeze in that brings a volley of input, and that <coughs> now can initiate this oscillation, which we see as the bursts of activity. This now is a good place to introduce a bit of philosophy from Aquinas, and that is his introduction of the notion of intention and intentionality. There is a common usage of the word now of intent. I want to go to the drugstore to buy some aspirin, that's your intention. But that is a trivialized aspect of the meaning. For the original designation of the term, it was the outward thrusting of the body to incorporate new information, bring it back in across the boundary of the self, and incorporate that into the knowledge base. And that outward thrusting now has been given many names, and I've listed some of them here. The drive, the instinct, the motivation, the desire, and so forth. These are all terms which relate to this outward <coughs> thrusting of the body. And that, I propose, is basically due to this capacity for mutual excitation, which embeds the motor system and is constantly forcing us or driving us or impelling us outwardly into the environment. This word intention actually comes from the word for bowstring, meaning the tension 
which propels the outward thrusting. And that is, uh, is simply, as I see it, a good answer to the question, you know, why do we do the remarkable things that we do? Now I want to take a little finer look at the mechanism of what is actually coming in on a given sniff of a given odor. We know that there are on the order of 100 million receptors in the nose on each nostril and that there are roughly on the order of a thousand different types, meaning that there is a hundred thousand receptors that are sensitive to any one outer, however complex it might be. Now that is a problem for the nervous system because <clears throat> how does the animal know, or how does the nervous system determine what category a particular input comes from and, or represent when you have activation of only on the order of a hundred or so out of a hundred thousand of these neurons of one type. Well, some form of generalization must be taking place. And that is carried out by the formation of what we call a heavy nerve cell assembly. I've schematized that here by the two red dots among the several that I've listed are uh, shown as the array of receptors. <coughs> These two now are feeding into the olfactory bulb and activating a local pool of neuron, which now, by excitation, co-excitation, strengthen their bond between them. That's a pre-existing connection. It's the one that's responsible for the background activity. But by increasing the connection strength between them, they form a bond. Now, this is repeated over and over again on different SNPs, each time recruiting new members from this population of 100,000. And what will gradually emerge then is a subpopulation which is interconnected and co-wired, firing together so that when any subset of them in the future is activated, even if it's a combination that's never occurred before, you have activation of the whole set. This is what computer scientists refer to as pattern completion. And it's very straightforward operation which solves the problem of generalization. Now, that heavy assembly essentially reports out what category the stimulus belongs to. It's not a representation of the stimulus. It's a manifestation of the category to which it belongs, or has been assigned on the basis of past experience. And there is an omission of which of those receptors was actually activated. That's abstraction. And furthermore, there is an amplification. And we estimate that a 20% increase in the connection strength of a heavy assembly can give on the order of a hundredfold increase in output of just that assembly. Furthermore, the output of the bulb is not the same as the input. I've indicated this in the upper layer by the parallel lines running downward, these arrows show that topographic mapping. And that <coughs> now is characteristic of all of the sensory systems. The output is a different projection. It is a divergent, convergent projection. It's the kind of operation that's performed by a lens, sending out activity from each part of the input to all others of the target, and at the same time, each target is collecting <coughs> input from a broad array of transmitters. It's a spatial integral transformation which essentially disseminates the news about the category to all parts of the output. It's a way of interfacing between the developed people, chemical requirements of the topology of the input to the developmental and topological uh, property of the output, meaning that 
This olfactory is information. This olfactory information is needed by multiple areas of the brain, and it's got there by this dissemination of a holographic light transform of the output. Well, that now leaves one further role to be considered by this olfactory bulb, and that is that the input now is a surge of action potentials with each inhalation, each sniff, but the output's an oscillation. And this now is based in a remarkable property of the heavy and cell assembly, which is as follows. There is a wildfire excitation of the mutually excitatory neurons establishing the heavy assembly, but they also are connected to inhibitory neurons. And they, by negative feedback, will create this oscillation. And that oscillation amplitude is enormously increased, a thousandfold, by the increase from the heavy assembly. So that what the output does now is generate a burst of oscillation. And that's what you were seeing in simulation on the right side of the diagram. And that's what I've shown you as the oscillations for the olfactory system. Now we go back to philosophy. <clears throat> Here is Carl Lashley, who introduced my teacher, Carl Freebrum, to the notion of mass action. And he raised this problem of generalization. It's one of the most primitive functions of an organism that is nervous tissue. And the problem is, how can you match together the specific definite cell-to-cell -cell connections with the equivalence of these over the whole assembly? And it's the heavy assembly that solved that problem. Well, that now is my background. I would say that all of the sensory systems operate this level, at this level after the pre-processing is done. And most of what you hear about and read about in the literature has to do with pre-processing, certainly all of the single cell work. And I'm not going to go into that direction any further. But I do want now to introduce the notion of the field of activity. In particular, it's a vector field. Our information comes now from recording arrays. Each of those little rectangles is an array of 64 electrodes, 8 by 8, which gives us a sample of the output of the EEG. And here you see it again in time. Each burst is initiated by an inhalation and transmitted onto the rest of the brain, most notably the olfactory cortex, and then to the entorhinal cortex and to the hippocampus, and then back to the entire surface of the brain, operating as a unified system. This is now uh, the left an example of a single burst of oscillation, and to the right, in the middle column, you see the spatial pattern of amplitude modulation of that activity comparing the difference between air and amyl acetate, the smell of banana oil. And the point here is that the difference between the presence of the odor and the absence of the odor is in the spatial pattern of the amplitude modulation, which we saw as a contour plot. We see an immediate change within the first <coughs> hour. In fact, in the first few minutes, of reinforcement of the presentation of this odor, either positive or negative. And that <coughs> new pattern, we figured, was certainly going to correspond to the representation of the category of the stimulus. Well, it didn't work out, because the next few days, we came back and looked at it again. The both patterns had changed. These are not fixed patterns. They are not representations of the stimuli. We concluded that they are the manifestations of the recall by the animal of what it knows about the stimulus, what its meaning is, what it signifies. So this 
now shows us the first clue that we're working now not with a network of a representational kind. It's a true memory system in which we're tapping into the knowledge base that the animal has. Here's an example of successive serial conditioning showing that with each new odor introduced, there is a new spatial pattern that would come eventually to repeat an earlier stimulus and reinforce that. And we have, again, a new pattern. So that drawing on our philosophy, we can say that Heraclitus was right. You never step twice in the same river and we never get precisely the same output from the recordings of our system because every time the animal gets a stimulus and recognizes it and operates with it, it now develops a new pattern. It changes the self with each new sample from the environment. And yet we can in fact demonstrate a local stability invariance, that is to say, when we repeat the stimuli with a succession of presentations, we get <coughs> clusters of points, each point representing the feature vector by which we describe uh, the 64 values of amplitude for the carrier frequency. Clustering now is the proof that we have a stable representation in the, or I should say, metastable representation, which is subject to continuous evolution. We can now describe, and have done so, that there are multiple basins of attraction, each having an attractor which designates the class or the category to which a stimulus belongs. And here is the most important distinction between the information, which is carried by single neuron in a definite location, and the distributed nature of the memory which is being read out, the neck recollection of the knowledge that the subject has about the stimulus. This is distributed, and we show that by having established a criterion of optimal classification using all of the channels of our 64, we can start deleting channels, picked at random, doing this over and over again in search for where is the information which is being classified. And the answer is, it's everywhere <coughs> and nowhere. That is to say, each channel that we remove diminishes the validity, the strength of classification in proportion to the number removed. We are working with a fully distributed holographic type memory. Although I hesitate to call it that because holograms are not the same, not a good model for cortical function. Holograms store everything that they are given. They don't abstract and delete irrelevant information. And furthermore, they have no inverse, uh, brains have no inverse transform. Holograms can't make decisions. Cortices do. I want to briefly here comment on <clears throat> the fact that every cortex, every sensory cortex, transmits the same mode of function. It's a gamma burst with amplitude modulation, which we can treat as a feature vector. And they are assembled by simple vectorial summation in the entorhinal cortex prior to introduction into the hippocampus, meaning that we have no problem here about the formation of the gestalt. And this is important because Wolfgang Kerler's conclusion is that <clears throat> a theory of perceptual or perception must be a field theory. And that <clears throat> essentially is our conclusion as well, that this is a vector field. And that was challenged by Roger Sperry, who figured that he would put strips of mica into the brains of cats. It's a non-conducting material, which is seriously going to alter uh, the field pattern of the EEG, of the electric cortical <coughs> that 
Wolfgang Kroeder was postulating as the mechanism for binding the feature vectors together. He also inserted silver needles into the cortex in order to distort or even abolish the field. No effect. Well, this was really a dramatic proof that the EEG, the electric potentials of the cortices, are certainly a correlate of behavior, but they are not the mechanism of interaction. And that now has not been as widely understood as it should be that the EEG that we're recording here is not the mechanism by which these cells are bound together. It's a correlate. It's an epiphenomenon. And what Sperry showed was that he proved that the noise that the cortex is making is not effective, but he didn't disprove the field theory. In fact, his demonstration would be equivalent to making a recording of the noise of an airplane taking off, setting up a loudspeaker beside the aircraft parked on the runway, and then playing back <coughs> the amplified noise of the takeoff, expecting the plane to take off. Well, that's not what took place. And in fact, this is what philosophers call a category mistake <coughs> after Gilbert Ryle mistaking a correlate or a, an aspect of these bursts, which is the field of potential for the actual event itself, which is the vector field of transmission of the action potentials, which are governed by the dendritic potentials, which are manifested indirectly by the EEG. Now I want to return back to the question of scale invariance, because the question would be, is this relevant to humans? I showed you a picture of a brain of a whale in comparison to that of a mouse, and somewhere in between is our human brain. And here in the upper left is a, an fMRI, excuse me, an, an MR, a magnetic resonance image. It happens to be my brain, which I'm rather proud of. <laughs> <laughs> and underneath the set of locations of the electrodes, which are recorded from the surface, 70 electrodes. Here's a sample of recording, simultaneous recording of the EEG on the scalp. And these are the amplitude patterns of first uh, activity, which were recorded from subjects engaged in a multi-sensory discrimination task assembling information between a, or, or which is a relationship between the visual and, and uh, tactile stimuli, which resulted in spatial patterns of amplitude modulation now of the gamma activity, excuse me, no, this is beta activity, in the range of uh, uh, 20 to 30 hertz. And you can see with the color coding or the, uh, the density markers that there are two different uh, patterns. This is simply a reflection of the uh, difference in the location of the reference, which is not relevant for our purposes. What is relevant is that each of these patterns can be recorded from 64 electrodes spread out over the surface and gives us feature vectors we can classify the patterns of activity which relate to what the subject is experiencing, is seeing, is reporting. That is, the different stimulus conditions which lead to two categories of input, one for stimulus configuration A, another for configuration B. Those two now give rise to episodic Bursts of beta activity, range of 20 to 30 hertz, oscillations, which are amplitude modulated and only last on the order of a tenth of a second, but repeat at intervals of roughly 140 milliseconds, that is to say in the beta range. So we have bursts of oscillation which are coupled to the beta oscillations in the foreground. 
And again, we have the circumstance that this activity is distributed. It is an amplitude pattern of oscillation spread out over the entire surface of the scalp. Then we can degrade the goodness of classification by taking out samples in sets of eight at a time, randomly selected, repeating over and over again, we find that this classificatory information is globally distributed. Now this is, I think, a remarkable finding for showing that the entire surface of the scalp displays what's going on in the entire surface of the cerebral cortex. And we have the occurrence of the bursts of activity at intervals in the theta range, that is to say three to seven times per second, restructuring the entire oscillatory behavior of the roughly 10 to 11 billion neurons in the cerebral cortex. And this is essentially a manifestation of what Bernard Barn, uh, Bars has described as the global workspace, whereby from purely psychological testing, he has concluded that there is somewhere in the brain this capacity for assembling all of the information. And what <coughs> I'm proposing is that this, in fact, does take place but it's over the entire set, and it's because of its capacity for scale-free oscillations. Well, that leads me to the last point, which I don't really have enough time to say anything about, but uh, I will comment that what we have is this repetitive bursting of activity, which <coughs> gives rise to oscillations, which I show here, in the form of the patterns in the forming the early stage of development of a single burst. This is the oscillation itself in the gamma range, and this is the envelope, the analytic amplitude. I call your attention particularly to an early stage when there is this downward spike that's a null spike, which is the event which initiates a phase transition, and then the expansion into an oscillation over the whole of the area. This is a look at the amplitude showing the phase pattern, the formation of vortexes, that's to say miniature tornadoes which spread across the cortex. And those are essentially a manifestation of these vector fields. It's far from the scalar fields of EEG potential. It's much more interesting and complex than that. Well, I will make one brief foray into history because it's important, I think, that you realize where the direction which I think that neurobiological and neuropsychological, neurophilosophical research is going to go in the present century. And that is comparing what people thought back in the 19th century with what we think now. In the 19th century, Helmholtz introduced the notion of the conservation of energy. He was an army surgeon turned neuroanatomist, turned neurophysiologist, and then physicist and demonstrated essentially the concept of nerve energy, which replaced the prior conception of animal spirits dating back to Descartes. Clausius introduced the notion of usable, accessible energy, free energy. And this now was picked up by the biologists, as shown here by Darwin, of his characterization of nerve force. Why this nerve force is liberated, he said he doesn't know, but all the physiologists of the time agreed that that must be the case, including Sigmund Freud, who introduced what he called the principle of neuronic inertia. It finds expression in a current passing from dendrite to axon. Memory is in contacts between the neurons that function as barriers. 
Notice that this was three years before Sherrington and Foster named the synapse. Well, this was a major thrust, a major accomplishment for neurobiology. It's the last time that there was a unified field of understanding, and this was uh, uh, Freud's goal was to form a satisfactory general conception of neuropsychiatric disturbances in terms of normal function. And he was very confident about this in this letter in 1895. And then in 1898, he says, I do not know how to go on, neither theoretically nor therapeutically, and therefore must behave as if only the psychological were under consideration. Why I cannot fit it together, I have not even begun to fathom. How come you have this crashing failure of the theory? Well, basically, it was that nerve energy is not conserved. We can show this simply by exciting a neck zone on two different places. The action potentials collide, they annihilate. So we don't have preservation or conservation of energy. And the effects on this on brain science were catastrophic. There was a big divorce between psychiatry and neurology. There's still a big gap between them. And psychology and philosophy and uh, uh, Psychology and psychiatry is a split into different schools so that there is no <coughs> accepted brain theory today. Well, my premise is that the next step is to go back to the thermodynamics, but to non equilibrium, far from equilibrium thermodynamics, and to introduce the second law of thermodynamics. You might say that there's been a detour for the past century into computational neuroscience. It essentially has replaced the notion of nerve energy, but now has essentially come to fruition. Enormously valuable, enormously functional, but leading essentially into <coughs> separation. So I think now that although there is much to be said about the neuron doctrine and the theory of information and that even at the beginning Shannon said that the semantic aspects of communication are irrelevant to engineering problems because that is meaning and meaning is not part of information theory. Similarly with von Neumann who said that whatever the language of the brain is it's not mathematics. Well now there is a mathematics, and it's been developed first by Alan Turing, and then by Ilya Prigogine and Herman Hocken. These are the new foundation for the advances which will take place, I think, in the next uh, 20 years. So we have a great deal to look forward to in terms of the capacities of the nervous system for implementing the action perception cycle which takes energy and that is where we need to raise the question of how do brains work meaning how do they use their energy to accomplish what we all want them to so i'll leave these references and thank you for your attention and godspeed thank you. to uh, open the discussion, but I'm going to give a couple of seconds for those who need to, uh, need to go on to the next topic. Okay, let me, um, let me begin with a, perhaps a kind of a concrete question for Walter. Um, in, in, the, in the middle part of your talk, you showed us the, uh, the fact that the, the patterns of activity are really quite variable from time to time, and yet there's, uh, if you uh, extract the principal components, you can find there's some, some common structure there. Um, I wonder 
you know, to the naked eye, looking, looking at those displays of yours, it doesn't look like there's any common structure at all. It looks much more like the common structure is in the similarities um, at, at, for different stimuli at different times rather than the same stimulus. Uh, a different stimuli at the same time rather than the same stimulus at different times. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about what those uh, common dimensions are, are actually uh, like that you, you extract with those components. Is there any way of visualizing them other than as points in the projection no. of the first two principal components? No, that's a very good question. And it uh, uh, points out the difficulty of <clears throat> comprehending or making comparisons between patterns which the, the naked eye have no meaning. Uh, if you take the pictures of a collection of people and transform those into the holograms and look now not at the recovered images, but just look at the interference panel, it make total no sense at all. And that essentially is the nature of the problem of how can we take those holograms and say there's anything there at all that is reproducible over time. Especially when the animal itself is evolving. So that essentially gives us a requirement to reduce this to some kind of manageable representation so that we can make comparisons over a large number of samples. And each sample is different because every time an animal is a, an experience of this kind, it inevitably is contaminated by background activity, the noise, or inadequate filtering or whatever to get just this, this canter. And so I think it's fair to say that, that this multivariate representation as a feature vector is the best that can be done at this time. What is more important than looking at the particulars of the contour map is to know what is the carrier frequency. Because each time this happens, it's narrow band, but the center frequency is jumping around. It's irrelevant. It's a throwaway. But what is important is the width of the path map. Nobody looks at the width of the path map. They should, because that is a key in understanding where the invariance is. Now, I've emphasized that the introduction of a stimulus initiates this burst of oscillation. And I've, in the literature shown that there is a degree of amplification of the signal, which very rapidly expands it. Take a look at, in terms of the numbers of neurons, you excite a stimulus which excites, let's say, a collection of a few hundred neurons. Each of those can excite 10,000 others. Doesn't excite all of them, but it excites enough of them so that then that excites another 10,000. So now you're up to 100 million. The third synapse, you've got more neurons than their entire cortex, 10 to the 12. Well, this now, it doesn't result in an increase in amplitude, it's an increase in density. So you have the thickening of the part, and that's what's essential for knowledge. Knowledge, essentially, is accumulation of the relationship of each fact to every other. And this is what's missing in machine intelligence. They don't have this kind of condensation. They don't have a postulate of a liquid-like state to which the system jumps. That's where, the, that's where the frontier line is now in how that state can emerge. But equally important, what is it that terminates a burst? 
the animal can't afford to take a stimulus and then have it last on indefinitely. It has to get rid of it. How can that happen? <clears throat> well, it turns out that that's very simple. When the activation occurs, it's not at one frequency. It's not 30 hertz or 35 hertz or whatever. It's a pass band, which is on the order of 7 to 10 hertz wide. Now that width of the pass band is a crucial variable. This was shown by Stephen Rice in the 1950s. He was a contemporary of, uh, of uh, Shannon. Shannon went on to fame and fortune with his information theory, and Rice disappeared somewhere in LA. <laughs> but <clears throat> the critical factor is the pass band, because that now creates interference. <clears throat> that sooner or later, depending on the width of the pass band, you get cancellation, interference, it beats. And during a beat, everything gets shut off. And this is crucial for the transition from the prior state to the next state that shuts off that past oscillation, frees up the neuron from interaction, and then allows them to be reintegrated, but now it's going to a different basin of attraction. And that occurs faster with more experience because the bandwidth is wider, is that the idea? No, the bandwidth now is fixed. That's well, a... What, what, uh, the reason I said that was because um, it seems to me that as we become more experienced, we, let's say, become uh, capable of processing uh, different signals at a much higher rate. And so we need to be able to replace the representation of each one with the representation for the next step at a faster and faster rate if we become. So I was hoping no, you think to make that contact you with that idea in your, uh, your notion. Well, you think that that would be the case, that uh, if that were the case, then uh, your frame rate would start off at, let's say, two or three frames. Mm -hmm. I think I have uh, an understanding of equilibrium thermodynamics as it relates to uh, a gas molecular transition or vice versa. But I'm having a lot of trouble understanding uh, how you're making the analogy between that and these mental states, I guess, uh, and, uh, and using the non-equilibrium thermo to work that out. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, at my hazard, but uh, let me do it this way, that uh, the first thing I have to do is to recognize that the variables that are used in static thermodynamic picture, the phase diagram for the uh, phase boundaries, have to be replaced by time varying variables. And the two variables that I use are uh, first the rate of energy release and uh, the rate of order increase, the neg entropy, so that I can essentially plot how the system changes over the cycle of the formation and dissolution of a burst. And for that I use a type of Carnot cycle in which we have the <coughs> initiation of a burst by an adiabatic expansion of cooling in this null spike which I showed followed by now the, the phase of doing work of constructing the knowledge, which involves essentially uh, the uh, uh, increase in firing rates of both excitatory and inhibitory neurons, meaning that there's an increase in metabolic demand, which is supplied by ATP, and then a compression, which is where I'm talking about this condensing, this condensation, followed by then the, uh, the dissipation of this uh, energy in the form of heat and uh, entropy. And so that in a nutshell is a characterization of a thermodynamic cycle of which uh, 
I think the is a, a model or a platform to which to begin to examine it further. Uh, I can, in fact, will refer you to a paper here on the uh, Ginsberg-Landau equation, which is available for your inspection on the uh, on the internet at this URL, in which this is developed in greater detail by my uh, colleagues in uh, in uh, Italy, Roberto Livi and uh, uh, Giuseppe Vicello. But that essentially is the direction that would go, and uh, I think that will be taken in the, uh, the coming decade, and not one that I can give a, a pat answer to. So thank you for your question. <coughs> so I think I have a, oh, sorry. I think I have a tentative grasp of how you get from the sensory information to this kind of global state. Perceptual offering. Yeah. Uh, through this kind of global state of oscillations and stuff, but I was just kind of wondering if you could speak more to how you get from this global state to uh, action again. Because right now, to me at least, these kind of oscillations, even if they are global, uh, it's hard for me not to think of them as this uh, kind of epiphenomenal, like they're happen they happen to be there, but it's hard for me to imagine how they can drive action. And so to touch on that. Yeah, basically uh, this is, uh, instead of going upwardly through the uh, uh, sequence of uh, progressive enlargement of the scope of activity, uh, generalization, now speciation, going back down again uh, from some uh, global invocation of an intent, which is uh, essentially an operation creating the prediction of what action one should take in respect to what this can found and what to look for. So that in generic terms we can say that there are two aspects. <clears throat> one is the creation of a strategic motor plan which is based now in large part on <clears throat> the hippocampal contribution of where the animal is and where it needs to go then a prediction of the nature of preafference, which is to set up the attractor landscape in all of the sensory system as to setting up the, uh, the basins of attraction for what, it is, what will be happening next. When the animal, let's say there's a, an alert, a danger signal that the animals receive, it needs to set up its attractor basin for whatever is there. And it has expectations. It's going to be either a predator, or it's going to be something to eat, or it's going to be something to, uh, to mate with. And that now <coughs> is the way in which the animal directs its action in the search for this information. That the action part of the action perception cycle. Now, well, most of my work has been done on the sensory side and the perceptual side. And so I invite your cooperation in looking into the, the devolution, into the speciation of this generic uh, um, intention into the tactical moves which are actually taking place. We're going to let Walter take one more question here, so just careful. <laughs> <laughs> Choose blind, you choose. Oh, well, I think you were calling on the gentleman in the blue shirt. So. I'm, I'm curious what uh, support or, or lack of support uh, for your uh, fluid gas phase model um, high dependent fMRI uh, has provided. Well, I, this is another whole topic. I've written about that also, uh, <coughs> which uh, you can find on my website, or you write to me and I'll direct you to it. Uh, but basically, uh, when dendrites become active, they do it with, by generating electric currents. And these have electric fields and magnetic fields, and they have metabolic demands, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, are met by fMRI. And so uh, those three aspects are all present, but each one of them is available only for different areas. That is to say, what fMRI shows is not the same 
spatial domain or time domain as MEG or EEG. And so essentially what we need to do is to put these together with this multivariate statistical analysis taking advantage of or responding to the challenge of the different time scales and space scales. So this is a hot area of research as well. So, uh, uh, in fact, my colleague is uh, uh, Vinod Menon, who works here in Stanford, who provided the MRI images that uh, were dealt with. The uh, MEG is provided by uh, Seppo Alfors in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and Harvard. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for that very stimulating lecture and review of the philosophy. Thank you.